From California to New York, from Amsterdam to the Caribbean, from Kansas City to Washington, D.C., in courtrooms, in classrooms, in conference rooms, and in webinars. Every day people gather at ABI events to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. Today, you are a part of a global conversation about our shared future. So, what is this ABI Talks? ABI Talks is an initiative of the ABI Board of Directors Education Committee, a committee devoted to creating the best and most exciting bankruptcy education possible. The committee plans and organizes this conference and the annual spring meeting in Washington, D.C., and helps set policy for regional conferences. This event today is based on the TED Talks format and ideals, but is independently organized by the ABI. So please be sure to thank the team of volunteers and ABI staff members who worked so hard on today's event. It is their ideas, dedication, and time that makes this all possible. The views you hear today are, of course, the views of those speakers, not necessarily of the ABI. We hope their talks spark an exciting conversation among you. It is a day for curiosity and skepticism, for openness and for critical thinking, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. Good morning again. I have the pleasure of being your master of ceremonies for today's ABI Talks program. Today you will experience some of the best ideas and lessons bubbling up from the bankruptcy community, all presented by five of your fellow ABI members. Our program, of course, is based on TED Talks. TED is an acronym for Technology, Entertainment, and Design. And these are the fields of experience around which the first TED was conducted in 1984. Since TED then, the TED program has become a globally recognized format. The ABI Talks program, of course, is younger, started in Taranea a few years ago. And that format has been copied at numerous regional conferences. Our speakers were selected today because of their special expertise in areas that we thought might be of interest to you. As we have in the past, we selected two programs from recent regional conferences. We were so impressed, we wanted to share these presentations with a national program audience. The remaining three are brand new. One important note on the format, unlike many of our other formats, we would appreciate that if questions percolate during today's presentations, you hold it until after the program. Our speakers will gladly meet with you in the hallway after the presentation. And now, on to the show. Our second speaker, is in the enviable position of having slept in his own bed last night. He's a bankruptcy and creditor's rights partner at Stinson Leonard Street in Phoenix, and he has a worldwide practice. He is also an adjunct professor at the Arizona University School of Law. He's also no stranger to this group, and he is truly an audience favorite. Ladies and gentlemen, ABI Talks is proud to present Thomas Salerno. Thank you. 8 a.m., man, who did we annoy to be here at this early, right? Let's talk about the J. Alex McKinsey lawsuits pending in the Southern District of New York. I'm sure you've seen this, you've heard about it. What's it all about? Hundreds of pages of drunkenness and cruelty, but the question becomes as we all look at this, is this a tipping point or is this some disgruntled financial advisor fighting someone else. This battle makes War of the Roses look like a minor disagreement. You know the names, I'm sure. J. Alex, a man with 40 years, give or take, professional experience, high-end, high-stakes restructuring, and he's taking on McKinsey and company and affiliates and their partners, et cetera, including some of Jay's former partners, and he's taking them on 
and they are the largest, one of the largest, certainly, standalone restructuring groups, financial advisory, business consulting groups in the whole world. I need to tell you, and it's important, that J. Alex is the plaintiff here, not Alex Partners. Why do I say that? Because Alex Partners called me no less than three times to say, make sure that everyone knows that this is not Alex Partners. I'm not kidding. And I think you'll kind of get a feel for it as we do this. But this is certainly a battle of the titans. It just is. Who cares, right? This is like sharks eating their young, whatever. Well, maybe not. Because at the end of the day, this could be just a case of a spurned financial advisor, someone who didn't get a gig, who's got money to burn, who wants to take a swipe at a competitor. Because you know, hell hath no fury, like a financial advisor scorned. Or, or it could be a tipping point. It could change the way we do bankruptcy law. And not just in mega cases. This is the sort of thing that I think could ripple down into certainly small cases and even mid-sized cases the curtain here has been pulled back to show us the dynamics and what goes on in these large cases and probably small cases as well in a way that it can never be put back because once you've seen it, you can't unsee it. And folks, we are watching a train wreck in real time here. Seven days ago, there was an order entered in a bankruptcy case in Texas. There's pleadings that are, going fi that are being filed. Congressmen, God forbid, congressmen are looking at this. This is a train wreck in real time. So the question becomes, is this tempest in a teapot, or is it, in fact, the new normal? You know, context is everything here. You know how professional retention happens, right? It happens at the beginning of a case. You got an emergency motion filed by an emergency motion by a super emergency motion. I have an emergency motion to set the emergency motion on an emergency basis. It's like the fall of Saigon without the fresh air. And in this context, we are retaining professionals. And those professionals have certain disclosure obligations. And why is it we do this crazy stuff again? That's right, because it's lucrative. How lucrative is it? Well, according to the J. Alex lawsuit, in nine cases between 2010 and 2018, McKinsey made $125 million in nine cases. The Lehman Brothers case between 2008 and 2013, aggregate fees, $2.2 billion. Billion, that's a B. So where there's money, there's competition among those who want to earn it. And where there's competition, well, there's potential skullduggery, I suppose, right? But this is not just garden variety, free market competition, because there's a bankruptcy overlay that we can't ignore. Because in bankruptcy, we are dealing ultimately, of course, with other people's money. It's a trust fund theory, and it's a zero-sum game. Because what I give to you, I have to take from someone else. It's just the nature of the beast. And so we return to the Alex McKinsey lawsuit. There's seven legal theories here. OK, I'm not going to go through them. Legal scholars will debate these for centuries. But you'll notice that they are premised in Title 18. That's the criminal stuff. There's four overarching themes, if you will. Theme number one, it's a pay-to-play environment. That probably doesn't surprise many of us, right? Because we all build professional relationships, professional networks. Number two, stacking the deck. I'm going to have incomplete, misleading, or in some instances, completely omit disclosures which are going to create potential conflict issues. Third, what's the point of the exercise? Well, of course, it's to get the gig and to take it from your competitors. And fourth is the catch me if you can. When questions are raised, if they're raised, you dribble out disclosures. And you make these incremental disclosures in such a way that sometimes, as in one case alleged in the complaint, the last disclosure came out just after plan confirmation. So I'll get there eventually, just give me time. Let's add some attempted bribery into the mix because here's what I call the free bite allegation. Jay Alex meets with the high muckety mucks at McKinsey and says, guys, you got to change your evil ways. You're gaming the system. And if you don't, well, you wouldn't like me when I'm angry. McKinsey's response is, come on, can't we all just get along here? How about if I kick you a few high dollar referrals? And you know, here's something nice, kid. Go buy something for yourself. Brings us to rule 2014. 
All right, you all know it. You've seen it a million times. Disclose connections, and it's a laundry list of all these things. According to the complaint, McKinsey's theory about this is less is better. And so what they did is they collected data from 13 cases in which McKinsey was involved. Hey, what's wrong with that? Facebook does it, right? So what do they show? They give us graphs. These are right out of the complaint. And graphs have a way, especially color graphs like this, of making it into newspapers and on politicians' desks. But they show in the 13 cases disclosures that were made by other professionals and the ones that were made by McKinsey. Those are the, that's the yellow one on the left-hand side there. And then, because two graphs are always better than one, they show us that on average in these same 13 cases, on average, professionals reported 171 connections while McKinsey showed a total of or an average of five. And then the complaint further reads like J. Alex has organizational envy because he talks about how large McKinsey is, and it is big, it's big. One of the largest standalone, if not the largest standalone in the world. But the better thing is the alumni network. You work at McKinsey, you are set. Because then you wind up in the C-suites of every country, every company in the country. Uh, it, it's a big one. It's, it's as if Harvard and Yale got married and had an incredibly connected child. That's really what it's like. <laughs> so. McKinsey, not surprisingly, is having none of this. They're not going to go quietly into the night. Balderdash, they say. We complied with the law. You don't like it? Well, but that's the law. And they attack the messenger, and they attack quite scathing. Jay is obsessive. He's anti-competitive. He's a lone rogue wolf. You'll notice no other financial advisors have joined in this lawsuit. Well, okay. That's true enough. Remember I said, Alex Partner said, make sure you tell people we're not involved. And it's true. But just because Jay Alex is paranoid doesn't mean people aren't out to get him. And so once, he may not be the most perfect, pristine messenger in the world, but let's look at the message, not the messenger. There's a lot to chew on here, folks. Three immediate questions come to mind. First, isn't this kind of the ultimate catch-22? Large, complicated restructurings require large, sophisticated advisors. And if we knock them out based upon connections, which is the very way they got their expertise in order to come in here, well, maybe we create the catch-22. You can't advise me to get me out of this problem because you've advised others and, you know, if those connections could keep you from it. It's an interesting catch-22. Second question on this whole bribe thing. I got to thinking about this, you know. And it occurs to me, according to the complaint, J. Alex says that McKinsey's been in this deal, he's been in this game, since 2001. So by the time these meetings take place, where they're told to change their evil ways, McKinsey's been gaming the system, if you take the complaint at face value, for about 13, 14 years. What if McKinsey had said at that meeting, you know what, you're right. We're getting out of the restructuring business. Sorry, my bad. Or we're gonna completely change everything. If in fact, the real goal of the complaint is to protect the system, would Jay Alex have said, I forgive you your sins. I will not bring to light some of the same issues that I raised that are raised in this complaint, which I know about, presumably, because I raised them in the complaint. So would he become, if you will, an accessory after the fact? And the third is where are we really going with this whole connections thing, when you got to disclose connections. I understand creditors, I get that, debtor, I get all that. But J. Alex goes a little further, and J. Alex says, you know, if you have given advice to competitors within the industry on unrelated matters, that's something you've got to disclose. And, you know, what is that, like a materiality thing? The competitor has 5% of the marketplace, they have 10%. Where does that end? That becomes a little dicey to me. But where is this all headed anyway? What is it that Jay wants? Does he want justice? Does he want to protect the integrity of the system? Maybe. Does he want disgorgement? Does he want a bigger piece of the pie in these restructuring fees on a go-forward basis? Maybe. Does he want all of those? Does he want to disqualify McKinsey in future cases? Maybe. But it doesn't matter. Whatever J. Alex wanted at the outset doesn't matter anymore at all. Because both J. Alex and McKinsey are all in. They're all in at this point, like in Texas Hold'em. Put all your chips in. Because now that it is raised to the level of an issue of protection of the process, integrity of the process, this is not a lawsuit. 
that can be settled. How do you settle this economically? Without it looking like a bribe, which is what the problem we had in the first place, right? But I'm going to be that guy there. If one half of what's in this lawsuit can be shown, can be proven in a court of law, why isn't someone going to prison here? Who remembers John Galeen? John Galeen, a former Milbank Tweed partner in the 90s, the Erie Bucharest case. For a grand total in fees, by the way, of $2 million in Sears, they couldn't do the first days for $2 million. But that's what they earned in the whole case, the Erie Bucharest case. And John Galeen did not disclose certain connections that his firm had. He did 15 months in federal prison, 15 months. Remember Milberg Weiss, not a bankruptcy, but the scourge of DNO carriers everywhere, the, the strike suit lawyers? They gamed the system in a different way. They gamed the system. All four of the founding partners went to prison. So why isn't someone going to prison here? I told you this was, we're looking at this in real time, seven days ago. The judge in the Westmoreland Coal bankruptcy case, based upon an objection by, yes, J. Alex, because J. Alex formed an outfit that goes and buys claims in cases, so he has an opportunity, as standing to object, filed an objection to the McKinsey disclosures. And what is it that the judge said seven days ago? Well, of course, we have to protect the bankruptcy process. We have to protect our government institutions. We have to protect the public and transparency. See, the minute I hear words like that, I get shivers, because I know nothing good can come of that. The a &R bankruptcy. It's closed bankruptcy, plans confirmed, everyone got their deal cues. But guess what? They moved to reopen it based upon, yes, inadequate disclosure. So the UST files a statement of position. I'm going to give you a spoiler alert. UST says McKinsey lied. That's what they said. That's one, that's one party's position. McKinsey will certainly be heard on that. So we come full circle, folks. Tempest in a teapot or the new world order? Four things are true from my view in the cheap seats. Number one, any professional who is not giving new and real focus on disclosures is brain dead. You better. Number two, given the political implications at this point, because politicians have now seen the graphs and they're making calls, and it's been in the newspapers, either the U.S. Supreme Court's going to tell us what 2014 requires or, God forbid, Congress tries to fix it. Three. I think, from my view, it's even money that McKinsey becomes the Milberg Weiss of financial advisory firms. They may be broken up, they may be gone, if in fact these allegations are true. Finally, is it a blip? I don't think so. I think it's a game changer. Whether that was intended or not doesn't matter anymore. It's a game changer. I think that we are very likely to see that these large institutional restructuring houses are going to have to break off investment banking arms, they're going to have to break those off completely in order to keep disinterestedness under the bankruptcy code like accounting firms did. Remember when they did that? They broke off all their, their financial advisory practices. So is all of this any good for the financial restructuring markets? I don't know, but it's going to be a hell of a show. Thank you. Thank you, Tom.